Welcome to the Rider Dojo with your hosts, Steve Diamond. Hi. And Larry Correa. Bonjour. Today's episode, Writing for Audio. <laughs> I did actually Google up all those ways to say hello, and I have like 20 languages ready to go now. Sweet. Sweet. We're going to do them all tonight. <laughs> no, we're, we're really not. Um, welcome back, everybody. We're glad to have you with us. Today is going to be another one of those uh, episodes where we tackle one of the bigger questions that was asked for us from our supporters. So remember, for 99 cents, you too can become a supporter of Rider Dojo and help Larry buy more mountains. <laughs> you can do it. I have faith in you. So if I buy the mountain next door, I can extend the rifle range. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Or you can buy it for me, Larry. Well, I, I would love for you to live where I live, Steve. That'd be great. I know. We could build a compound. Yes. Have our own ATF agent spying on us. Hey, life goals. <laughs> All right. So the question that we were asked back in our Q&A stuff that we were like, oh, that's way too big. Someone asked us specifically about writing for audio. Yep. And this was a huge one. And, and the, honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to hit this one is I do really good in audio books. You do really good. In um, books. Just so you guys know, uh, full disclosure, if I could do in print books, what I do in audio book, I'd be on top of the world. I, yeah. I've hit number one on all of audible before. Uh, I have dominated. Um, I remember some, I saw a Facebook memory from the other day. It was actually from faith hunter and faith hunter pointed out that in uh, whatever the category was, it was like uh, urban fantasy. I think is category of the top 20 books in that category that week, 15 were me and faith. Yeah. I remember that was several years ago. Well, I mean, between you, Faith, Jim, and Laurel, you guys just murder urban fantasy. Yeah. There's, there's other, I'm probably the smallest of those four, but, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're definitely. enormous. Oh, man. Yeah. Jim and Laurel are like orders of magnitude <laughs> above the rest They've of us. they extra zeros, man. Well, yeah, to be fair, they do. But, but, uh, several years ago, uh, on this topic of writing for audio, there's actually one of the guys who's, uh, uh, senior executive at Audible. He's a great guy. I've worked with him a lot over the years. I don't want to name him because the last thing I need to do is have people just randomly calling this guy for, sure. hey, can you publish my audiobooks? No, yeah, I'm not sure. going to do that to him. I'm going to do it to him, though. Oh. Just kidding. Okay, don't. <laughs> He's a great guy. Um, no, but I've worked with this guy a lot over the years, and he um, actually pinged me one day, and because this is something that I had talked to him about and something that I had thought about a lot, and because I, I do well in audio, was I uh, I have thought a lot about what do I do different, and I, I've been very analytical about my work versus other writers' works. Mm -hmm. What do I do different to write well for audio book market? Um, and so this senior VP at Audible came to me and he's like, Hey, I got to teach a class on that. I've been asked to teach a class on that as a con. So could you give me your notes? And so I actually went on my blog, uh, and I wrote a blog post many years ago. And if you search on my blog, it's monsterhunternation.com. It's ask Korea number 17, writing for the ear, tweaking mm -hmm. your writing to work better in audiobook form. Uh, and so we're going to go through some of the bullet points of that today. Well, and, and I think what I want to point out here is. We are seeing just this. I, I mean, I thought four or five years ago, six years, seven years ago, I thought that the audio market was just exploding then. I I had no idea. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's enormous. Really now. interesting because 2020 was a really bad year for a lot of writers because, you know, for us, they're traditional published writers. When 95 or 99 percent of the retail establishments that sell books in America, like the actual stores, yeah, are yeah, shut, down, shut down. Yeah. Uh, that that's a real kick to the to the groin of your of sure. your sales. However, audiobooks, uh, I don't know what they did overall up or down, but audiobooks uh, I believe kept going because mm -hmm. people were still. That said, I think they did drop some because there weren't as many people commuting. Right, and commuters are a huge audience for audiobooks. Yeah. Um. So I wrote up my 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 notes for this guy for him to use for the class, and actually wound up turning this great big blog post. Mm -hmm. But something I thought about a lot, and the first thing is when you guys think about audiobook, um, we're kind of in a weird thing because it's. We write for multiple type, different delivery systems. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So when we write a book, a physical book or a ebook, um, that's going to be read and absorbed. You know, they're going to read it with their eyeballs. They're going to process it with their brain. An audiobook is taking the same thing, but it's going through their ears. But the thing is, the delivery system is different, and the way your brain processes the two is different. So it helps you as the writer to be able to understand the difference between these two. 
so you can kind of capitalize on it because there's stuff that you can do that works really good for print and better in audio. Or there's stuff that you can do that works great in print, but sucks in audio. Um, so what I like to do is I do the stuff that works in both. Okay. Is, is how I try to do it. All right. So what's the first point that you want to talk about? Uh, the first point is, uh, is reading your stuff out loud. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is huge. So when I write, I actually read a lot of it out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so as I type, I talk. Oh, okay. Or I will type and then go back and talk. And sometimes it's not actually completely vocalized. But I will go through at the pace that a narrator would read it. Because keep in mind, guys, when I talk about the difference between eye and ear, when you read a paragraph, you're going to read that paragraph in like 15 seconds, 20 seconds, just boom, boom, boom. And really, we talked about before, like with profanity, the way your brain works is you're currently reading one line, but your eye is already scanning the line above. Or I'm sorry, the line below, and your brain is still processing the line above. So you're actually looking at three times of information as at once. Mm -hmm. So you go through that paragraph, 15, 20 seconds. A narrator is going to read that same paragraph, and it's going to take about twice to three times as long, yep. especially if your voice talent is somebody is delivering it kind of like in a, uh, 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 I'm trying to say, a, a dramatic format. Yeah, from what I, from what I was told, um, who was it that told me this? It, might, it actually might have been our buddy, our buddy Craig, because um, I I started reading some of my own short stories in audio form. Oh yeah, yeah, recording and, them here. Mm -hmm, yeah, I was recording them here uh, for the for my short story anthology in the in our studio. Yeah, literally in the studio for the the short story anthology that comes out basically any day now. Um, it's called What Hellhounds Dream and other stories. It's going to be great. Anyway, I was reading a couple of the stories to to do my own audio of them. One because I'm too cheap to pay anyone, and two because um, it would be it was good it was good experience for me to just read my own stuff and read it out loud like like we're talking about, and I think that that's one of the things that that really hit me was okay like it takes me a lot longer to read this out loud oh, yeah. than it does to just read it. I think I think the average is somewhere between seventy five and one hundred twenty five words per minute read out loud when in print form. I can read a two to three to 400 word page in a minute, mm -hmm. just, just reading, reading. Well, think about this. So a book that you would pick up, like, a, like say a normal size paperback book is going to be like a 12 to 14 hour, 16 hour, maybe audiobook. Sure. Yeah. How many hours does it take the average person to read that? Like four five, like of actual yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. About five. So you're looking at, my rule of thumb is probably figure triple. Triple. Triple the time. No, that's about, that's fair. And, uh, and some people are speed readers too. I really run into these, oh, these people like devour a book. Our, our, our buddy, Alan, who can, who can read an oh entire gosh. book in like an hour. Alan, Alan is a freakish speed reader. I don't know what his, Ugh. his word per minute rate is, but it's literally, and he absorbs and it he too. And he retains it. It's kind of crazy, but yeah, no, I can't, Ugh. I can't do that. But I, I, he's, he's read many of my books in a night. Like yeah. I, I'll give it to him and the next day he'll be like, oh yeah, that was great. Yeah. And he starts talking about it like, wow, dude, most people can't do that. Mm -hmm. But, but most people you're thinking about three times the speed. So when I want, when I want you guys to go through, take some of your manuscripts you're working on, read the parts you're working on out loud to yourself or, or kind of like sub vocalize them in a dramatic way. So if you have, you know, your wife is at home in the next room and you're, you know, you know, ranting through an action sequence or your kids are home and it's a sex scene. Don't do that. That's just gross. <laughs> so be classy guys. Um, or you're talking about a torture scene that you just wrote. Oh man, I, uh, that's me. You know, the thing is that when you do this, what'll happen is it will show you all the parts that are glaring to the ear and which, many of which we'll talk about here in a minute. Yeah, I was going to say, let, I, I want us to get into this. Yeah. So, but when you, when you start doing this though, guys, you will find a lot of stuff that drags. You'll find dialogue that's wooden. Like a lot of dialogue will look great to the eye, but you'll read it out loud. And then all of your sudden you're like, oh, that just sounds stupid. I don't know. Have, I don't know if you've noticed this. I've noticed this a lot. I was doing this in our in our servants of war edits, um, specifically with Christoph, because Christoph has a very very distinct way of talking. Um, and I was which going, we actually did based on an actor, correct? Which is a trick that we do when we work together. Is anytime we've worked together, we've picked actors for all the characters or most oh, of the characters. Gosh. It's just easier that way. It's just easier that way. We both have the same person in mind. Uh -huh. So I was going through tweaking all of the, the dialogue, making sure that it was consistent. There's certain things he does, like he, he never uses contractions and he's always very proper. And, uh, and he, I think I actually might've added a couple contractions for when he was stressed out. Yeah, no, no. And that, and that's legit. I did that towards the end as well. And that was from uh, reading out loud. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and that was my, and that's my point is 
I was, I was reading things and it wasn't until I, I read his dialogue out loud that I realized in certain areas, in certain places where I'd, where I'd written dialogue of his, that it was wrong. And it wasn't until I said it out loud, yep. pretending I was the actor from that movie, you know, Christoph Waltz, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're <laughs> Love not that subtle. Guy. So, you know, I was, I was reading it like, like I was performing how he was performing that character just cause I could. And I was like, oh man, nope, nope. This scene isn't right. I, I, I need to change these words. Or, you know, he's, he's very much why use one word when I can use three sort of a guy. Yep. And so I, I had to change that. Whereas in other cases, as we're reading aloud, you know, maybe Alarian or whoever, we're like, oh, oh no, this is way too many words for this character. And you start chopping them out, squishing the sentences because together. Because he's a, because the main character is kind of, he's a farm boy. He's a yeah. simple to the point, you know, he's a straightforward kid. Yeah. Uh, and so he would deliver different. And it's interesting too, you'll find that you start doing, like you are an audiobook narrator mm -hmm. and you'll start getting more and more dramatic as yeah. like this dramatic bit. And that will really accentuate that stuff to you. Uh, this next bit is only, this is, this is more for Audible specifically, uh, um, cause it was written for a guy at Audible, but, uh, make sure your narrators, uh, usually you have a chance to communicate with your narrators. Right. If there are any specific terms that are pronounced a specific way, make sure you work it out with them beforehand. Yeah, give them the style guide basically. Um, like I love my narrator. I have lucked out on narrators. Man, I you have the best. Best. Now, most of my narrators are not gun nuts though. And I write sure. gun nutty fiction. Um, and so I have to go through and like, okay, this is, it looks like this on the page. But if you're not a gun nut and you see three zero dash zero six American gun nuts, we automatically say 30 aught six. six. Yeah. That is not how a person who's not a gun person is not going to narrate that. Yeah. Uh, when I work with Tim Gerard Reynolds for, um, son of the black sword, he's fantastic he's so narrator. Good. Uh, Tim, uh, because many of the names and places are, are Indian in origin. And Tim would ask me, he's like, how do you pronounce this? I like, however you think it should be pronounced because, um, the way they're actually pronounced are, are not at all how they're spelled to an English speaker. Right. And so what's going to happen is in that one, between the two books, it would just fall apart because they, the names wouldn't even like, like Ashok in real life, it, it pronounced the correct way is not in a way that any normal English speaker would pronounce it. Well, and you're, and it's you're, more of an O Shulk and I can't well, even make it. Yeah, I can't and, do and it. And you're correctly. writing, and again, understanding the audience to which you're writing to, you're, you're writing to a primarily English speaking audience. Yep. And so you got to understand that that's who is going to devour this book. And, and so therefore it needs to make sense in their brains. Yeah. That's it. Son of Blacksword has actually been a bestseller in, uh, in English language Indian market, which is kind of oh, awesome. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty baller. That's awesome. Okay, this is when we've talked about another episode. Uh, oh, actually, look at our time. Okay, we're good. We'll start this one. We'll we'll we'll, we'll wrap this one up after the yeah, break. Sure, because this is a big one. Um, overuse of dialogue tags. Yeah, we talked about this in a previous previous episode about writing dialogue, but this really is hammered home in audio. No, we remember what I talked about earlier, guys. Your brain perceiving versus your your eyes versus your ears. When you see, I said, he said, Bill said, Bob said. Or Bill asked, Jim asked, Bob asked, and you see that over and over again on the page. Reading it, you're fine. Your yeah. brain just kind of automatically tunes it out. It's like static. Uh, when you listen to it, oh man, that gets grating. It becomes extremely grating. And in fact, what happens is the more unnecessary it is, the more grating it is. And the more now, old school authors, this was completely normal and constantly used. And it's mostly used because uh, all the I said, because it kept the reader from becoming confused with who was speaking in the scene. Yeah. The problem is when you're an audio book, each and every one of those I said's, if the narrator is delivering this correctly and your dialogue is quality, uh, honestly, guys, about 80% of them, 75% of them are probably unnecessary. The only times that I says and he says are necessary directly are when you need to clarify because based upon the dialogue being delivered, you can't tell otherwise. Like a lot of times if a character has very specific voice, they're going to talk a certain way. You're going to know which character is talking just well, yeah. on that. I mean, we were just talking about, you know, uh, like Kristoff and, and Alarian, right? Yeah, so if you have a when, scene when they're talking, when they're talking to each other it should be pretty evident who's talking to the other. Well, because one is a superior to the other. Yep. There's, there's ways to, to. One is more that. verbose. Mm -hmm. uh, and also one is more uh, eloquent. Very much more eloquent. You know. In a violent way. Yeah. And whereas the farm boy, 
uh, he is also violent, <laughs> is going to have to be restrained around a superior who could have him killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to he's going to be more he has to be more diplomatic out of fear, uh, but he's also going to be more direct and more honest. He's a straightforward guy. He's not an educated man. Right. Um, so when you deliver those dialogue, if you take advantage of those distinct character voices, you don't need the I said, he said, she said. Well, and all you're doing there really is you're strengthening the narrative voice of that character. Absolutely. If you strengthen the narrative voice specifically to write them more distinctly so you don't need dialogue tags, you've now created a more interesting you're doing a and good powerful job. character. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to go a little bit more into the, the dialogue tags and, and, and different ways in which you can kind of cheat the system a little bit. Yeah, there's a bunch of workarounds here. Yeah, so we'll be right back. Meet Jack Bishop, a normal kid at a normal school who is shocked to discover that he has the unexpected ability to see psychic residue left behind by both murder victims and monsters. When his father is abducted from the mysterious company where he works as head of security, Jack teams up with fellow student and mind reader Alexandra to search for his father and stop the series of murders happening in his hometown before it is too late. Steve Diamond's debut novel, Residue, is a young adult supernatural thriller for readers looking for action, suspense, humor, and horror. Residue is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Pick up your copy today. And we're back. Here we are again. We're still talking about uh, dialogue and writing for audio, how to streamline everything. What we were talking about right before the break was the, was, you know, the overuse of dialogue tags and how specifically for audio, man, you got to cut it back. Um, but what I want to talk about, Larry, is the ways in which you can kind of game the system. So you can say the same things without saying, you know, John said, yep. John said this, yeah. I said that, John replied with this, then yeah. I replied with that. Now, a good narrator is like an awesome weapon. So this is one place where the audiobook does have the advantage because mm-hmm. a good narrator is like the secret weapon of like being able to deliver these and put a little inflection in them or a little accent to them that you can't do in the print. That said, on your print side, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Structuring your scene in such a way that it's clear who's speaking beyond just the voice in that they use the other person's name. Now, if you look at real life conversations, people don't use their names that often, but like, because no. like, me and Steve are here talking, I just said me and Steve. Clearly, Larry was speaking there. Right. Or, uh, you, you know, the old, as you know, Bob. Now, right. don't overuse that too, because in real life, once again, this is when it comes to you're reading it out loud. If you use the person's name too often in conversation, you sound like a car salesman trying to force his brain to remember the customer's name. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to overdo that. Um, it's all about clarity. And so we talked about this in the previous dialogue episode. Um, so there was structure. There was also using other words, you know, the synonyms to said, or you know, yeah. don't overuse this because you can fall into the same trap. Yeah. But when necessary, it is nice to be able to differentiate people without using set. Um, a lot of people get hung up on like, well, never use words other than set. That's old 1950s advice. Whatever. That was great. Some people stick to that. I, I personally disagree. But then again, you got to be careful for an audiobook because you don't necessarily say, blah, 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 Bob shouted. Because your narrator is going to, if they wrote the scene co- correctly, we're going to know he's shouting because things are loud and adventurous and he's in a, in a position where he needs to shout to be heard or whatever. Um, so there's ways like that. Really where this comes in to the most uh, difficult to use is when you have three or more characters interacting in one scene. Yeah, I know. That's, I know that's when I have the most trouble. That's when it actually becomes necessary to use dialogue text. Yeah. It was actually interesting when I wrote Lost Planet Homicide because it was specifically written to be an audible product originally before it would go into print. Um, I wrote it and the original draft, 20,000 word draft with quite a bit of interaction. I did not use the word said once. The original draft, I did not. I'm trying to remember. I actually did have to go back in for clarity purposes where it was absolutely necessary. I believe the final manuscript. I remember this. No, because has, there, were a few, there were a few comments that I made where I said, I can't tell who's speaking. I know. And I tried. My goal was to see if I could pull it off without any dialogue tags at all. And I almost did. Yeah. I had to go back and final, final, final draft. I think there's like three or yeah, four. Yeah, that's not bad though. 
No, that's actually extending. To give you an guys idea, my first novel, Monster Hunter, um, I actually used, I want to say like 500, which is actually a fairly low number. Well, that book was, was like 200,000 200, words. My most recent books, like Son of the Black Sword or the, the, um, Destroyer of Worlds, I think I used a hundred. So oh, one yeah. fifth of what I yeah. used when I started out. Just to put this, so I still use them, but I use them a lot less. Um, but if you look at like the Monster Hunter memoirs novels, that number goes way up because John, uh, who I wrote these with, his writing style is very much more, he prefers just the clarity of the said. Okay, sure. sure. And even then, I, that was one of the things I changed a lot and, and, and moved those down. But that's just his writing style. And I also, whenever I do try to do a collaboration with somebody, I always try to honor their voice. I try not to over... Uh, well, but it, the thing, the thing that was good for you and I is, I mean, we're both here preaching the same thing. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm always going and trying to gut like all of them. So when stuff. we collaborate, we actually, we actually, uh, to start, we're doing it less than most yeah, collaborations for sure. would. For it's sure. funny though, because most collaborations I, I end up in, uh, I wind up telling this to the other author mm -hmm. at some point during the thing is like, well, why are you doing this with my dialogue tags? I was like, well, it's because of this and I'll explain it. And cause a lot of them just don't think of it from the audio background. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, you and I, it's not like this is the first time you and I have had this conversation. No, it's funny too, because I, I also, I listen to audiobooks more than I read now. As do I. Because reading it kicks my brain into work mode. Yeah. Whereas listening to an audiobook does not feel like I'm working and I could just sit there and paint minis. Well, and, and I appreciate when I'm reading a, uh, or when I guess what I'm reading, when I'm listening to an, on a, an audio book and the, the narrator is just killing it. It's just killing it. And I'm not even hearing like the seds at all. I can just tell who it is because I'm listening to the book. I know from the way that they're speaking who it is. Yep. And that's, and that's the, the, like you said, that's the advantage of the audio book. One of the nice things about a narrator too is usually mine will read the book and then they'll send me a list of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then be, and so if I do have a part where it's unclear who's saying what, they'll be like, hey, who's saying what? And and that tells me that I failed. And that's when I failed. And I have actually had a couple times in books where, when I think I've mentioned this before, where the narrator read the line of dialogue in a different character's voice. Yeah, in those, there's two of those I'm aware of, mm -hmm. but both of those, I went back and I looked at it and I was like, well, I could see why he made that jump. And it actually works yeah. to a different character delivering it. And so that's one of those, I just didn't see that coming. That's artistic interpretation. And his answer is, is actually as valid as mine. It actually worked out. And I will never, ever, ever say what those are on the air because, <laughs> you know, as far as you guys know, it's all perfect. Uh, I got a couple examples here right. that I wrote, I, I wrote these down so I could think about how to do them, but, um, you know, quote, you can put things in dialogue and then at a said, Bob leaned back in his expensive leather chair and lit his Cuban cigar with a flaming hundred dollar bill. Or you can just as easily have the character do something interesting or descriptive in the paragraph where he is talking. Right. I use this all the time. So yeah, I do the same thing. Dialogue. The character is doing something while Some they're action. delivering dialogue. Even if it's a little thing like Steve adjusted his glasses, you know, Which or. Is what I do often. Or, or we said, we, for the other example we did is like Larry said when he took a drink of his giant Coke, which I always have a would giant always Coke yeah. every time we're <laughs> recording this. Basically, guys, we record until I run out of caffeine and then we call yeah. it a night. <laughs> but uh, and this is when I pointed out with, the, with, the, with, the, with four or more people talking or three or more people talking, this is when it's really good to put the character's name in the dialogue that you are delivering. Yep. Um, that's really handy. Or in, in, in a lot of those cases when there's multiple, multiple people in a scene that are all talking or all involved, um, I'll lead the scene or I'll lead the, the paragraph that leads into some dialogue. I'll lead with the character doing something just yep. so it's clear up front who it is. This is a good way too, to keep your action moving yep. or your plot moving. Like, like there's a scene, there's the, so it's not a dialogue only scene in that the, the characters are still doing actiony things like if they're like if we're writing a crime drama have them having the conversation while they're doing so for example like one of the greatest crime drama scenes of all time you you're talking the about the wire the wire and we can't and once again we're not allowed to swear on this podcast but the the fception scene yeah one of the if you have not seen it just put this into you know f-u-c-k in uh ception the Wire, put this into YouTube, watch the scene. One of the greatest writing and acting bits I've ever seen on television. These two characters have a scene where they're investigating a crime scene and every line of dialogue is just the F word. But each one is delivered in a different way 
as they are doing stuff, as they're piecing together this murder, yep. it is one of the best written things I've ever seen in my life. And it just shows, like, even without the differentiation, you can tell who's doing what. You can make it clear. Because as McNulty is, you know, looking at the fridge, right. or you said, that, the and then Bunk goes to the window and says, yeah. and so it's all this. So if I was writing this scene, it's the same thing. I'm doing action interspace with the words and quotes. Well, and so often when, when you're reading dialogue, people get into the trap of, they use dialogue to, to portray a bunch of information and they're, they just, they're just shoving it on the page to get it through. Forgetting that the characters are actually in a scene doing things. Um, I, I've heard it described as, um, as white room syndrome, where everything is just, people are talking, but you don't know what's going on around them. So they might as well just be in a white, like, like yeah. sanitarium room. So by the things that Larry's talking about, they serve multiple purposes. One, they're, they're nice workarounds for the seds and the asks and stuff like that. But also, they also lend a lot of color to the scene. They lend detail to the scene. They move the, the plot, the action forward. And when we say action, we're not talking about guns blazing. We're, we're talking about movement and momentum. Yeah, it could be guns blazing too. It could, very well, it definitely could be. But I was, I was using, the, using the, the crime scene investigation. But it sure. could be, it could be, um, it could be anything. You, you could have a travel log. Uh, you know, you could tell them about the, you could be describing the sites as that point of view character perceives it. So like, you know, Bob can have his dialogue and then he's out looking at the majestic vista talking about Bob's feelings. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about Bob's feelings as this is going on, clearly we know who just talked. Um, and the other example I was going to use is uh, it, when, I, when I talk about the guy lighting the $100 bill on fire. Later on, I, can, I don't have to refer to him by his name. I can refer to him as the rich man. Yeah. And it, you know, so mix up the titles of people. Mm -hmm. That way you're not just using the same person's name over and over again. And you think about most of your characters that you've created, you can have a couple of descriptors that are going to make sense that no one else in the scene is going to own that descriptor. Don't get too creative on this because then it loses readers. Like, you know, the, the delicate dainty dancer with the porcelain skin and purple hair said, blah, blah, blah. All right. Like, that just sucks. That's okay? a little too much. Yeah, it's too much. You know, if it's just like... Again, it all comes down to point of view character who's seen them. Yeah, because if I want to talk about the, 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 the you know, that Bob said, but Bob's a detective, and the next line I can remember, the, de the detective did this. Mm -hmm. You know, mix it up a little bit. Main thing there is because you want to avoid repetitive word usage. Yeah. There's first names. There's last names. There's titles. And then there's... Um, there's like unique descriptors depending on who's who's looking at them. Yeah, if one's a tall guy and one's a short guy, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yep. Now on this, when you're doing this, um, don't get too carried away. Like I said, the purple dainty haired dancer is going to like start to get tiresome. Um, repetitive word use is one of those things that bites you in print and in audio. That's it's really galling bad. in both. Um, so just this is something you'll get better at as your your practice. But you'll scan down the page and you'll start to see like this river of words, almost like you're in the matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you'll oh. see where you've used. I heard the. I had. Oh. I didn't watch the new one. <laughs> I'm sparing myself. Oh. Well, Spider Man was good. Well, Spider Man that was, was awesome. Good. Um, but you're going down the scene. If you see that you use the word sincerely four times in a paragraph. That's going to sound jarring to your ear when you read it out loud, and it's going to be jarring to your eye because you're going to pick it up multiple times. Yeah. So you got to really watch out. Repetitive word use sucks. That's what synonyms are for. Mix yeah. it up. Change the sentence structure so you're not doing that. Uh, we talked a little bit about character voice. Um, character voice is absolutely amazing, and when you get a really good narrator, oh, my gosh, like, like Bronson Pin show. It, when he narrates one of my audiobooks, he that man is a one man radio play. Uh, and, man, and I'm hoping he's our reader. I hope so too, because I haven't had Bronson do a project for me for a while, and he's one of my regulars that I've used a lot over the years. He's done like six novels for me. Yeah, I would love to have a Bronson one again. Oh, he is so such a pleasure to work with. I just want to be able to tell people that Balky is our. He is so he good. Audio and he's reader. a classically trained actor. Yeah. So this is one yeah, of those things that like he, a good narrator. Uh, to a good book, it, the, the synergy where the sum is greater than its parts, you know, and that's some, well, honestly, a lot of you guys, when you're starting out, you're not going to get to pick your narrator or if you're no. indie, you're going to be doing it yourself oh, or gosh, my, the, the, the reader for, for residue, um, 
was not great. So much so that like it was tanking my reviews. Yeah. So I had to pull it. Yeah. See, like Bronson Pinchot is one of the greatest audiobook narrators of all time. I know. You know? And so, so I'm, I'm kind of jaded and I got Ollie Wyman, uh, who is amazing. And then Adam Baldwin. Adam Baldwin is legend. And then freaking Tim Gerard Reynolds. Tim Gerard Reynolds. I had, I had, uh, uh, Tim is amazing. He's so good. Tim has gravitas. And then, uh, Ray Porter did oh, my right, Ray Porter. end of the storm. I forgot uh, about Ray Porter. And he does all of Jonathan Mayberry's. Yeah. And Ray Porter, man, he is great. He's really good. So honestly, the thing is, guys, a good narrator can make the book better, but you can't necessarily bank on getting that, especially at the gate. So what you're going to do is you're going to make the best product you can, right. and hopefully in a way that it's foolproof, so even a bad narrator is not going to screw it up. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's kind of a crapshoot, but the more you can make interesting and cool character voice, the more that, the more the actor has to work with. So... So I know that I know one of the things that you do after you, and we've talked about this a bajillion times, and that's when you're going into the next book in your series, you go back and listen to the audiobooks. Are there any points in time in which the narrator loses continuity? Well, no, no. I was going to say, I, I'm sure that they do. Oh, yeah, they point. do. Um, or, you know, I mean, I know that, um, I know that Ollie, uh, the Oliver Wyman from, from the first books of Monster Hunter up to the new ones, like his voice for Franks has completely changed. Um, a, a bit, but mostly because when he did Nemesis, he had to do a whole book from yeah, Frank's. So it, it shifted, right? What I'm wondering is, uh, all these great narrators and their voices and stuff, have their voices influenced you and how you're writing scenes going forward? Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's really interesting because I'll have the interpretation of the character in my head when I first start. Then when I go back and I listen to the audiobook, I've gotten a different interpretation of the character. And it's almost like I was a director with a screenplay and I got a different actor mm -hmm. uh, than what I cast in my brain. And so, yeah, they do definitely uh, do that. And I found that it makes the next books better because you start to write towards that delivery. And I think that actually helps. And it makes the printed book stronger too as follow on the series. I would assume that it also helps the making sure that the, that the voice that's in your head that you're putting on paper is, is, is delivered, right? It does. And it's interesting too, because we talk about continuity just a bit or in previous episodes, we talk about continuity. Sometimes the narrator will lose the continuity too, because keep in mind, this is a guy who they have like a 16 or 20 hour performance, but their time in the studio oh to gosh. do this is it's probably closer to 40 or 50 hours. And they're doing this two years after the last book. Yeah. So for these guys, sometimes they will, they'll, a character's accent will change from one book or the other. And the readers will notice because the reader, they, they listened to it yesterday. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so to them, it's jarring. To the narrator, they didn't even realize they were doing it. Yeah. And that's, that's one, but, uh, like Bronson Pinchot is such a perfectionist. He realized he had done that with one character. He went, he, he went back and re-recorded every single line of dialogue no from that character. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. The dude is amazing. He's a perfectionist, but I've had other character voices change. I actually had Tim Gerard Reynolds, um, Jagdish, oh. the warrior Jagdish okay. in the first book, Jagdish. And the second though, he changed it to Yagdish. For the oh. first part of the book. And then I think he realized what was happening and went back to Jagdish. Oh, really? Yeah, but was, I think it's one of those, it's just where you read a name. And once again, this is not a common English name. Yeah. You know, this is not a uh, not an Anglicized name. And so your brain's going to read it one way one time and one way a different time. And he just had to pronounce it that way. I, which is good, though, because I prefer Jagdish. I think that sounds cooler, um, you know, yeah. than, than doing the Y for the J. Yeah. You know, the, the Jakob, Yeshua, you know, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I prefer that, but that's just a human thing. That's going to happen. What I hope y'all realize here is, and, and, and I love talking to Larry about this stuff because, um, he's very technical when it comes to this. And, well, this is I, one of those areas I'm actually good at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're good at, at a multiple number of things, but, um, when it comes to like nuts and bolts of writing, this is one of the things where, um, like Larry has this down because like you said, like you said earlier, Larry, um, <laughs> Steve said, Steve said, uh, as he pointed with the knife hand. At See, Larry. that was unusual. That was totally useless. Cause only two of us here. I know. <laughs> um, like, like you were saying earlier, it, gosh, this, this whole thing is, is important and you've made such a good living. Um, and had so much success writing for audio 
that it has become something that you have, you know, started to tailor your delivery to, you know, and that kind of becomes a, a self-fulfilling cycle there. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is, and, and I hope everyone listened to this, and that's all these things that we're talking about, some of these tips and tricks, while yes, it does help with audio presentation and it does help with streamlining what people are going to be hearing aud audibly through their ears. Um, it also just helps your book. It helps you tell a better story. It helps you cement scene setting better. It helps you create characters with unique voices. And so by doing all these things, yeah, look, yeah, yeah, of course you're, you're helping with audio, but you're also doing the thing that's the most important out of all this. And that's, you're making your story better. Yeah. Because we, we are. We're working in, we're artists working in multiple media at one time. And so you got to kind of tailor, and I see people like, well, well, audiobooks are different. No, 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 not they're really. not. That's a rookie mistake. Because if you do the things that make audio good, you make your books better. That's right. And, and you got to think of the two as a symbiotic relationship. It's not one or the other. Yeah. Now, what I want everyone to do here, um, I, I know a lot of you prospective writers out there you have stuff that you've written. So what I want you to do is take that out and I want you to read it out loud. And I want you to try to streamline things, take out the SEDs. Um, if, if by taking out the SED, it makes things completely unclear then see why it's unclear. Maybe you can adjust the sentence that way. It, effectively, what I want you to do is make, make a, do a, a small revision on just a, a piece of a story or a short story and have that go. Now, if, if you haven't written anything yet, because, you know, you're, you're still working up the courage to do so, um, it, it's, it's not a problem. Just grab a book off your shelf and start reading it out loud. Um, you're going to learn a lot from doing this. You're going to learn like, oh, this is interesting. Like, like uh, the, the way the sentence is structured, if, if we had shortened it just a little bit, it actually would have rolled off the tongue a little better. Take those lessons then and then work up the courage to start writing and write your freaking short story and then do the first homework piece that I just said. All right? Absolutely. All right. Well, Larry and I are super grateful to all of you. Thank you for turning, tuning in and listening to us every week. Um, we, uh, we love you all and we're appreciative of you all. And so uh, we'll be back again here soon. We've got uh, another episode coming up soon that's, that's going to kind of segue off of all of these things that we've just talked about. So uh, stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Naibo. New episodes come out every Wednesday, wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Yeah, if I get there before final call, I can get a sushi bowl. <laughs>